partnership between Design Hammer and Able, two different firms. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about accessibility baseline. Um, and then talk about the kind of collaboration process between a design firm and another firm and then accessibility testing firm. And then a couple of key takeaways. Uh, and one of the things that I think is pretty interesting through this process, we definitely ran into a couple of gray areas uh, where we had to uh, collaborate and think pretty, uh, pretty closely about how to deliver a usable, accessible experience. So uh, a little bit of an intro. Uh, so let's start off with, with y'all. Um, so who here is responsible for a website that has some accessibility compliance requirements? That is basically everyone in the room. Um, is anyone responsible for accessibility validation in your organization? Let's say a third-ish of uh, folks in the room. Um, and is anyone here a frequent user of assistive technology? One person, there we go, maybe two. All right, uh, that is not uncommon, and I think part of the core of the challenge of uh, accessibility uh, from a development perspective. So uh, I'm with Design Hammer, we're a full service uh, web strategy and design development firm uh, based in North Carolina, a lot of group work. Um, kind of we focus on making websites that are, uh, that solve business problems, uh, and that's for you know, whatever type of organization. And then I'm Steve, I'm the driver of consulting there. Uh, I do a lot of reusability, accessibility, basically anything that is not uh, dev work or design. I don't do any of that stuff. Uh, and then the voice of God today is from Ava. So Ariel, if you want to talk about Ava very briefly. Hello everyone, so at Abler, we really want to make sure that we are removing barriers for the digital world for people with disabilities. We do that by offering digital accessibility services, um, but we also really work towards changing the mindset of people in the organizations, um, and we do that through various ways. We have our disability inclusion training, as well as a plethora of other trainings that we offer. We also have our Abler Works program, which we train people with disabilities how to become digital accessibility analysts, as well as we are starting additional programs as well to help them gain meaningful employment. And uh, a little bit about yourself, Ariel. And I am the Accessibility Project Coordinator here at Accessibility at, at I am also a Trusted Tester Certified, as well as one of our Accessibility Analysts here at Abler. Um, I have a extensive background in project management um, from accessibility, real estate, nonprofits, and so on. Um, but we like to say accessibility here is contagious. Once you start, it's you just want to learn more, especially if you're always up for a challenge. So what are we going to, are we going to cover today? Um, kind of very basically, what's accessibility and why it matters. Um, this is not going to be the be-all and end-all of accessibility uh, sessions. Um, there are like about a half dozen accessibility sessions at GovCon this year. Um, and I think that uh, accessibility has really become uh, a lot more part of the conversation in the past decade I've been uh, in the business. Uh, so you can definitely get lots of different perspectives on accessibility. We're going to kind of set a baseline. Um, we're going to talk about some of the benefits and limitations of different types of uh, testing that you can do. Um, there are a lot of, again, different options for accessibility testing, and there are definitely pros and cons to them. Um, and then we're going to talk about how you can incorporate an accessibility partnership into your workflow. I'm going to really be from a perspective of a firm working on a project or a client, um, but I think this is going to be relevant for folks in a lot of different roles, a lot of different types of organizations. Uh, and we're going to talk about some examples of some gray areas. Um, you know, there's uh, some guidelines. Um, sometimes it's very clear what to do for guidelines. Other times it's not. And from our project, we're going to talk about a few very specific gray areas and some of the uh, solutions that we came up with. Uh, and then we'll um, talk about how this like uh, helps to not only meet the letter of the guideline, but also helps deliver a usable website for users of assistive technology and users with disabilities. Uh, a couple of disclaimers. Uh, neither of us are group developers. 
Uh, so, you know, you can definitely trump uh, stump me with uh, Drupal specific questions. So feel free to feel that you don't need to try. Um, We'll be covering some, expe uh, some specific issues, but uh, it's a kind of, accessibility is kind of nuanced, and um, uh, it's a nuanced process. So you definitely need to think about your own particular website, your own particular content. Uh, so uh, kind of your mileage may vary a little bit, and also um, we're not providing official legal accessibility advice, so uh, not going to do that. Uh, so a little bit of project background. Um, so we worked with Duke University Health System, uh, specifically with the Office of Clinical Research. Um, they gave me a really long quote about what they do. Um, I cut it down about 50% to fit on the slide. I'm not going to read it to you. The short version is, um, they, uh, Duke University uh, has a lot of different clinical research opportunities that they, uh, they offer. And one of the things that's interesting, uh, so Duke is based in Durham, North Carolina, that's where I'm based out of. Uh, one of the things that's interesting for them is there's a, a good mix of different communities there. Uh, so it's very possible so that you get a, a, a nice demographic mix of your uh, clinical research, which means that there's a lot of clinical validity to doing that research. But uh, there are a lot of challenges with um, you know, the background of clinical research and people uh, researching on communities rather than with communities. So the uh, Office of Clinical Research wanted to create a new website that uh, really interacts with the communities to uh, get more people uh, involved in clinical research. Uh, so there's a, you know, it's basically, this is a joint effort between uh, two different acronyms, the Office of Clinical Research and the Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute. Um, basically, they were willing to replace an existing in-house developed uh, directory that was, uh, user hostile is probably about the right choice. No one was a fan, but it was built in-house. Uh, but, uh, you know, one, since one of the chief goals was to kind of connect with these communities, this really had to be something that's highly usable and since it was uh, also really important to connect with folks of um, all different uh, backgrounds, health status, and stuff like that, accessibility was a critical part of this, right? Not just um, folks who do screen readers, but folks who have cognitive disabilities, age-related stuff, all sorts of things. Um, and uh, it's also important since they saw this as a, a kind of key piece of being a like, bi-directional um, communication platform between different communities. So there's a lot of interest in this website that is usable and accessible. Um, a couple of major project components, uh, some of these will kind of click in a little bit. Uh, we had a daily feeds import of uh, all of the clinical uh, information that's in the directory. So um, all the information is up to date and fresh. Um, Multilingual support using uh, Drupal 10 multilingual stuff, which is pretty solid, general. Uh, we did user testing uh, to make sure that it was a usable experience. And then uh, we had the WPEG 2.1 AA as our accessibility requirement. So I'm going to turn it over to Ariel to talk a little bit and set our accessibility 101 baseline. So here at Abler, we, this is our approach that we take to accessibility testing. The first thing that we like to do is an accessibility scorecard, and it just sees where you're currently standing and kind of gives us a, a standing point on next steps. From there, we like to do a full audit, which is where we go in and we test the site. We make sure that we are trying to find all of the issues as possible. We do this by running an automated scan to find all of the underlying issues. But of course, that's not going to find any, everything, so we go in manually as well. And that's where we make sure that we get full usability testing as well. Um, and we like to do this with our full team. We have quite a few people who use different assistive tech in their daily life, so they're going to have a different approach as well on how things should be very usable since they are the ones who are using this tech on a daily basis. 
Um, we also like to make sure that we're going through with magnification and all of the different um, assist assistive technology. Um, then we like to make sure that throughout the process, we are educating our clients on accessibility and the best practices um, once we deliver as well, and make sure we are setting them up with the best resources. Once we've delivered, we like to make sure we work with our clients hand in hand during the remediation process. That way, if they have any questions on our findings, or maybe we didn't express it very clearly, or give them the best recommendations for their platform, that way we can kind of work together and get creative. Because accessibility is not a one answer for all. Sometimes you have to get creative and figure out the best solution for their website. Um, and that's but also what we do within the validation phase. That's when we can go in and make sure that the issue has been corrected. Because as you guys know, sometimes when you're correcting things, other things pop out, right? It's kind of like shoving all of your dirty laundry in a closet and then all the other stuff falls out. So we just like to make sure we're not creating other issues along the way. Um, and then once we're done there, we can to give you a VPAT or an ACR, which is an accessibility certificate uh, compliance report. And it just says that this is what we've tested and this is what we found. And if there's any lingering problems, how you can um, go about it. And then this is just some of the disabilities that digital can be affected in the digital world. There's visual, auditory, mobility, cognitive, and then of course there's a plethora of other disabilities um, and hidden disabilities that people may not know about. All of these things are things that we try to catch within our testing phase and are incorporated within the testing's guidelines and standards. And then here, this is just a brief description of what accessibility means to us. Um, it's an inclusive practice of removing barriers that prevent digital interaction and ac access sorry, for people with unique abilities. So we just want to make sure that everybody is able to access your content, understand your content, and interact with that content as well. Um, and by doing this, we follow the WCAG principles of POR, which is perceivable. This is going to be anything um, that users can identify content and interface elements, operable, so these are going to be controls, buttons, navigation, um, anything that you want them to be able to interact with. Understandable, so this is going to be the presentation, design fl flow and follow the predictable patterns, so um, making sure your menu is always in the same order and people know exactly what to expect. Um, this can also go down to things like headings and just making sure that everybody isn't going to get lost along the way because they know that the pattern is going to follow the same way. Um, and then robust. So this is the function of all appropriate technologies and making sure that anybody can access the content no matter what assistive technology they may be using. And then this is kind of the very start of where accessibility kind of started was with Section 508. So if anybody is ever looking for something to read up on, I highly recommend it. It's a great, fascinating story on how Section 508 became. Because before that, it was kind of the Wild West. <laughs> there was nothing really for people with disabilities. So this was the amendment to the Rehabilitation Act in 1973, which requires access to programs and activities that are funded by the federal agencies and federal employment. It strengthened the requirements for access to electronic and informational technology in the federal sector, um, and they were really the ones to lead the way. And then from there, the ADA compliance came in, and that's the American with Disabilities Act. Um, it became law in the 1990s, so really not that long ago, um, and really was kind of where the boom started with, you know, the internet and everything, and kind of nobody was really thinking about how people with disabilities would be able to navigate the, the internet. Um, so the ADA is a civil rights law that prohibits the dis discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life. 
including jobs, schools, transportation, and all private and public places that are open to the general public. So these are my things that you might think more of with physical disability. Uh, you guys might see those buttons that open doors, and this really shows how accessibility helps everybody. And then the WCAG. This is the gold standard that we follow for accessibility guidelines. This is takes years and years for people to come together and they really go through what guidelines should go in, into the process. Um, and it is from the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines is what WCAG stands for. Um, people pronounce it all kinds of ways. You might hear WCAG, WCAG, we just say WCAG, which was published by the World Wide Web Consortium. We also say the W3C um, for short. Sure. And that's the Web Accessibility Initiative. So there's a lot of abbreviations that go in there. And they just provide recommendations for making the web content more accessible. And it's broken into 13 guidelines. And within those guidelines has 78 uh, success criteria. And this kind of just goes into more of that. But within those 78 success criteria, those are even broken up further into A, AA, and AAA compliance. Um, and that's kind of going to get you on that journey down the accessibility path. You start with A guidelines, and that's going to be the very minimal to be accessible. And then you can step it up to AA, and that's going to where you're going to really ensure usability for everybody as well. And then, of course, there's AAA. We always like to say AAA is kind of um, nice to have, but not always necessary, and sometimes very unnecessary. So that's kind of where getting to know those checkpoints comes in handy, because when you're just checking those boxes sometimes, you won't want to get all those triple A's, but sometimes that can actually affect the usability of the site as well. Um, and then as far as automated versus manual, here at Abler, we like to use those hand in hand because we find that you cannot find all of the issues with automated, but instead we like to make sure we are incorporating that with manual testing. As I said, 70% of our team, if not maybe even higher, represents people with disabilities. So that way we make sure we're getting that human-centric approach and really making sure that our, project, our products and our clients' websites are gonna be accessible for everybody and not just usable. Um, so this is just the limitations of automated testing. I know with the emergence of AI, we really think automated testing should be the one-stop solution for everything. But we have found that that only finds about, um, oh, sorry, it looks like that's actually, I wrote that a little bit backwards. So we find manually 70, 80% of those issues, and automated testing tends to find about 20 to 30% of those issues. And there's very limited in the amount of issues that it can find. For example, keyboard accessibility. It's not going to be able to find all of those issues since it's not going in and actually interacting with the content. Um, it's not going to be able to detect that logical flow or the meaning of the content that human approach would be able to assess. It's really only reading the technical rule base of the code. Um, it works best, we find, for that initial scan just to see what's kind of underlining to solve. But we really like to utilize automated tools for that um, ongoing monitoring. So that way, in case later on there's been an update with any browsers, that will start finding those issues that might have popped out from those updates. And the benefits of manual testing. We are very big fans of manual testing since it's real users who can find the issues that will affect the real people who are accessing your site and your content. It's that human touch that will interpret the content and the meaning behind it, as well as the testers who are native AT users can find issues that others may overlook. And that's just because we are so used to being able to fill in that data that we don't even know that we're using it. I know all the time within our team, Angus, who's our senior accessibility analyst, he'll find things right off the bat that I had not found after already navigating through the site, even with using a screen reader. 
but just because you can't help but just automatically fill in those things that you um, can see or just know are going to be there. Sure, and I'll just jump in real quick. Um, I think one of the things that I found uh, in you know, my, uh, my journey with accessibility is uh, that you, know, you can definitely find, you can read the guidelines, you can use a screen reader on your laptop, but to echo Ariel's point, if you aren't a native user of assistive technology, you're going to miss stuff. And I think that there's a lot of danger in particularly where there's an accessibility requirement, just trying to have a developer or a PM or a QA person do your accessibility testing in-house uh, by yourself, because I think it gives you a lot of issues. Like you're going to miss important stuff. Um, you, know, you might be filling in the context like Ariel mentioned. Um, you're not going to account for common usage patterns. Uh, and you know, it takes more time, frankly. You're not used to it. Right? You're, you're going to either do a half-hearted job or you're going to take a lot of time to do it. And then I think it results in a false sense of accessibility by, uh, by doing that. Right? So it's a, I think it's a real issue and I think it's something that as accessibility continues to become more and more mainstream, it's important that we have users who are native to assistive technologies actually participating in this because that's the only way we're going to get real accessibility and usability. Right, and it's really easy for us to be like, oh, okay, that works. I mean, I got there eventually. But then when you see a native screen reader, for example, navigate a site and you realize how they got there and how much work it took for them to get there, you kind of have to think, would somebody who's visiting my site struggle to get to this point or would they take off off my site and go find the product or whatever we want them to find somewhere else? And then this kind of goes back to that usability as well, how we like to make sure our analysts use assistive technology in their everyday lives. So like our screen reader users, for an example, um, they can they use JAWS, NVDA, VoiceOver, and TalkBack. Um, we do like to test with those individually because we do find that each one interacts with the site a bit differently. So that's why sometimes when we are finding issues, we might indicate that it's a specific screen reader issue as well as magnification, color contrast. We want to make sure that we have that high contrast um, in case we have users using gray style scale <laughs> or have um, color blindness, which actually affects such a large population of our people. And it's just one of those things that are just easily overlooked, especially because we all have our different brand colors. We don't necessarily think about what the contrast is that we're using it. Um, alternative inputs, such as keyboard, control switches, and braille back. Um, keyboard navigation is going to be extremely important since a lot of assistive technology is going to be tied into those keyboard functions. For example, the tab key. That is always something that we encourage people to try when they're getting into usability testing, when they're na navigating the website. See how far you can get on the site by just tabbing. Um, and if you can even follow where you're at on the site by just tapping, since that is going to interact with a large um, of our assistive tech, such as Sip and Puff, and different things that can plug into the keyboard. And then, of course, speech. Speech technology has come a long way with Siri um, and all the other voice inputs. But again, our goal is just to make sure that our digital content experiences are going to be compliant. But we also like to take it a step above that and make sure it's going to be actually usable. Then this, of course, has come a rise lately is overlays. We have seen them all over the place. They are taking over. Um, and a lot of people want to know if that's all you need, is if an overlay is going to solve all your problems. And unfortunately, they do not. They're just going to be kind of a band-aid solution because it's not going to fix the underlying problems on the site. Um, and if you have those underlying problems, the overlay is not going to know how to correctly fix all of those. Um, and I know a lot of people think that as long as there's an overlay, it's going to protect you from litigation. But of course, that's not true. Um, you want to make sure your site is actually usable to protect yourself there. Um, and they can, of course, cause more usability issues for the user. 
a lot of these overlays, you gotta make sure for it to even be used that you're gonna be able to access those options, especially if you're using assistive tech, which sometimes is not gonna happen. Um, and making sure that all of those overlay functionalities are going to be able to work on your site. Um, they can be incompatible with a lot of the assistive technology that we've seen, especially screen readers, and they do not always comply with the WCAD guidelines. So, uh, you know, to kind of get back to our case study, uh, it was, as I mentioned earlier, it's really critical for Duke Health that the, uh, that the site be accessible and usable. So, um, I wanted to go through a few places where we actually had a few examples of some of, some of these gray areas. It's a place where I think this collaboration really helped us deliver a more usable product at the end of the day. So, um, it's kind of our collaboration process we deliver to both the client and neighbor at the same time at a few different stages. Uh, and we consolidate feedback from both, uh, where it was very much a straightforward accessibility fix from neighbor, we just go ahead and do that. If there was a choice to be made, then we would uh, spend some time with the client talking through the pros and cons of the choice and then go from there. And then we resubmit a revised version to Abler prior to submitting to the con uh, client to make sure that we, we submitted a revised version from our perspective at that stage of the project. We were in compliance with the, with the WCAG guidelines. Right? So basically, we had a, a basically four different stages wireframes you know, uh, for kind of layout and prominence, design, illustrating look and feel. Right? And then beta candidates will be still a fully functional site, though uh, there may be you know, content remaining, and the content was there, and then the final candidate. So basically the final candidate is we think everything's done, uh, and so we had able to loop in in each of those places. So when we had an issue that was that able to report back to us, and uh, Ariel and Tim, they delivered a great spreadsheet of like, here's all the things that we found, uh, here are suggested remediations. Um, basically, there were a couple places where we're like, okay, looks like there's an issue with just implementing this fix, right? Either it's a usability issue or there's some other mitigating factor we need to talk about. So what we would do would be discuss, uh, basically discuss with Abra the challenges with that particular uh, default adherence and we have to elaborate on some ways that we could be creative in order to make sure that we have an accessible, usable site that actually worked with the content that we had in front of us. So our, uh, all of our examples are from the study directory view, so it's a Drupal view. Um, basically, it's got a lot of filters, has a lot of information, um, and these sorts of things are a place where I think accessibility is most challenging because if it's just content on the page, that's pretty well understood. I think the the WCAG guidelines do a good job of just making that very straightforward. But when you've got something more complex, it's like that from a data source, then you get into some issues of like, how do we even make this work? So here's just a, uh, a screenshot of it. Basically, we've got filters on the left, and then we've got review on the right. Uh, all the filters are driven by that feed import, as is all the data on the right, the study cards, have very long sciencey names. Um, so, you know, this is, you know, assistive technology or not, there's a lot of information that most of the people reading this don't understand. That's just part of the nature of this information. So, one of the issues that we ran into very early on was novel. Uh, so, basically, um, there was a uh, they would report that the dollar didn't match because we had the filters uh, coming after the results when the page were because it didn't make sense to, from our perspective initially, to have the uh, to have the user, the screen reader, go through all the filters before they actually understood what it was they were filtering, right? Um, and you can see those are two pieces, obviously, as we know how the responsive works. If we want to follow the normal DOM order, it would be uh, filters, then, uh, then uh, content, then switch it around initially. 
Uh, so the, the challenge was, you know, we've got basically, um, basically we've got kind of a nuanced situation here, right? The first time someone comes to the page, they don't know what they need to filter. But subsequent times, they actually probably want to skip stuff and get right to what they want. So we added basically a skip link uh, that uh, shows up so they can skip to the filters uh, once they have some context on the page. And that was something that we talked about, like how do we, how do we make this usable, right? Because if we've just been like, well, we just need to match the order, then we're introducing a different usability issue. So this was a place where some collaboration really helped deliver a better experience. Um, another one, very common, whenever you're using cards or something like this, is multiple links with identical text or multiple links to the same page in a row, right? It's a very common pattern for uh, post assistive technology is just to tap through links, right? Um, so you know, this was an issue kind of for two reasons. One, you know, you're, you know, we have, as you saw in the slide, we've got you know, study details and contact as our CTAs there, so that's the same over and over again. But if we were to say study details for study name, that becomes unwieldy you know, for, for users of assistive technology or for anyone, right? It becomes really a mess because those names are crazy. So uh, that was kind of the challenge there was, you know, we've got this card presentation that's nice, we scannable visually, but it's a challenge for users with disabilities, and the names of studies are almost gibberish. So you can kind of see that. So one of the things that the Able team suggested was actually wrapping the cards in a div with the, with the ARIA labeled by attribute set with the study ID. So there's context for a user with a screen reader to actually be able to understand, okay, this card, it's all the same study, right? So hope you can kind of see that inspector view there, just how that was kind of wrapped. Right, and then the, the last sort of thing, the kind of cha the challenge that we ran into was kind of results message, right? So once there is a uh, interaction with the form, there needs to be a results message so that users of assistive technology can actually understand what it is that they just did, right? Um, and so, uh, kind of by default, you know, uh, since the page reloaded, there wasn't a way to get someone right to the results. They're now back in, like, why is the page reloading? I don't even know what's going on. So uh, basically what we did was on submission, we changed the page title to indicate the new results that were loaded, and then set the focus to land on the number of study results. So that, in concert with the, skip, the second skip link there, resulted in a pretty good experience for users of screen readers, keyboard mappability, to be able to get through the, um, the, you know, the, the directive. Right, and actually be oriented and kind of understand what's going on there. Um, and I thought that, like, to me, um, I've done a few accessibility projects before, this was an instance where we wouldn't have come up with this stuff in house, right? By ourselves, we wouldn't have understood the, the issues. Maybe we can read the guidelines. The guidelines don't tell you to do this, right? The guidelines say you have these principles, you need to kind of figure it out. So coming up with these sorts of solutions, this is the sort of stuff that the reason I thought of this session was to say, hey, work with someone that can help you make a better site that's more accessible. So feedback's been great uh, from everyone involved. Um, you know, hopefully it continues to, to work. Uh, you know, if it continues to uh, connect with audiences, then that will result in more efficacious studies, which will result in better health benefits for everyone, everyone benefits, right? It's pretty awesome. Um, so I want to kind of close out and then leave a little bit of time for questions with a couple of other common accessibility gotchas, uh, just ones that I think that we often overlook. This one I know I always overlook. You need to provide two different ways to get to every page on the site, right? 
Um, so we made a conscious decision with this site, given that there, there's not like, there, you have basically the, um, the clinical trials information, and then you have some events, and you have, um, you have study results, but most of the stuff is accessible by those three views. There's very little other content. So it didn't make a lot of sense from a user experience perspective to provide a search uh, interface, right? Just a standard site search. It just didn't make any sense. It was like, what are you going to get there, right? So uh, that was one of the things where we actually had to provide a, uh, a full site map as a secondary way to find every page in the site. And we had to patch um, the site map module we used so that it would actually pull in all the feeds data but you know, it was a fairly low technical fix to actually get that second way to, uh, to find all content, so both through the views and through the site. Um, uh, Ariel, you want to talk through uh, some of the form stuff? Yes, um, so, and with the forms, one of the biggest things as well is going to be the color contrast, right? If you can't see where the form is to click in, you're not going to be able to input your information. As well as with forms, you want to make sure that those labels are persistent. I'm sure we've all clicked on a form field that once you've clicked on it, that placeholder text has disappeared. That can make it be very difficult for some users to know where, what they were even putting there, especially once forms get quite large and complex. Um, as well as with the visible label, you want to make sure that those labels are programmatic as well. We've seen quite often where form fields, when you're using a screen reader to navigate, will just announce as edit blank. And when you're just hearing edit blank, it's going to be quite difficult to fill out that form. Especially when you're using a screen reader, it goes into a forms mode to navigate through a form. Um, and they'll tab through each of those. So what's going to happen is you're going to have to keep trying to get out of forms mode to be able to read any visible text that might be there. But if it's only going to be placeholder text, that's not going to be available for them as well. All right. And uh, the last sort of accessibility gotcha was one that I hadn't even thought of um, before the project was uh, when you're using uh, multilingual content, you know, uh, screen readers actually apparently read the HTML lag tag so that they actually know how to pronounce the words that they're reading aloud. So if you have content that is not all in English, you need to make sure that the tag is set correctly. And so that can be very straightforward in a fairly informational site, right? Google's native uh, multilingual functionality works pretty well on this, right? You can swap between stuff, you can have a good link between different nodes on this is the Spanish version, this is the English version, stuff like that. But a couple of places where you might run into some challenges are say you have a view, and the view has content that may or may not be in, um, may or may not be translated, right? And this is a real thing with this particular site as the, um, the uh, study information is scientific and medical in nature, right? So you need someone, you can't use machine translation, you need someone who actually speaks Spanish and understands the medicine and scientific language to be able to make a correct translation, right? So uh, one of the things that we found was with views, you have some function, some functionality that you can say, when you've got multilingual enabled, either show me just the translated content and language I'm viewing in, or show me if the translated content exists, show me the translated content. If it doesn't, show me the English. Right? You have that option. So this is an area where the, the site is not officially fully accessible because we made the decision that it was better usability to when someone's viewing the site in Spanish, to provide them also the English content that's not translated, rather than just the subset of translated Spanish content, because we knew not everything was going to be translated. So that's just another common gotcha you might run into with accessibility. 
So a couple of key takeaways, and we'll take questions. Uh, we are almost in time. Um, so I think the, the big thing is automated testing is not enough, right? You miss a lot of stuff. Um, even if you're doing manual testing, yeah, I, the, the word I was using is a naive manual tester. That's me. Um, you're going to miss stuff. So you get a lot of benefit from working with uh, someone who is a native user of system technology. Um, and then, you know, there's the, I know a lot of times developers, content uh, creators, they want you to just check the accessibility box. And it, it really just doesn't work that way. Uh, that's why people want overlays to work. Uh, but, you know, you, you need to, like, it, it's a process, and it have to, you've got to really think about it with your content and your functionality. So, um, you know, it's, it's really important that you recognize that when you kind of are building an accessible website, you're probably going to run into some gray areas unless your website's very straightforward. And you have to think about it, and you have to figure out what you're actually trying to provide users and what actually makes sense from an accessibility and usability perspective. So uh, last question, I'm going to go ahead and show the sponsor slide because I was holding the show sponsor slide. Thank you, sponsors. Uh, so yeah, uh, questions, we are one minute to time, but I will stay afterwards. Yeah, go ahead. accessibly what filters were selected. Um, that's a great question. I actually don't think that we've got that uh, echoed there. That would be a really good question. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question for me? I couldn't quite hear uh, Yeah, on the, um, on the study results page, uh, back there, uh, when we show the results, like how many results there are, saying these are the filters that are applied. Um, so that's probably a place where we could actually improve the usability accessibility by adding that, um, adding those elements, like the filters that are applied there, the next to those elements. On WCAG 2.2, what our thoughts are on it? Yeah, yeah. So for WCAG 2.2, we were actually really excited because it's been a while since there's been any updates. Um, there are talks that WCAG 3.0 should be right around the corner, which will incorporate more of those checkpoints for apps. Because since WCAG 
that is so thought out. They take so much time to develop these guidelines, and so many people contribute. It takes a while for any of these to be implemented. Um, so because of that, we are a little bit behind when it comes to things like apps and mobile usability. So we did see more of that get incorporated with WCAG 2.2, um, and we are expecting, hopefully, to see more of that in WCAG 3.0 as well. Um, but one of the some things that we saw come out with WCAG 2.2 would be things like the size of where you can click, which I'm sure all of you have tried clicking on something, but the target size was so small, you just could not get that, maybe the X to close or something like that. So we are excited to see that being incorporated in 2.2. Um, and there's just been a few other things that have been implemented, but some of those have already been part of WCAG, um, just as far as AAA compliance, but those have now been moved to AA compliance. So you may have already seen some of those um, being tested. I think I heard that question, I hope. <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you guys too well when you're asking. You got a thumbs up for that, thanks a lot. Um, I guess it's a uh, oh, lunchtime everyone, so let's give Ariel a round of applause. Uh, to give you a for uh, thanks y'all. Uh, thanks, Ariel. Thank you guys for having me.